Greetings. This is Angie Balsley, Executive Director of Johnson County Special Services and Surrounding Schools. This is my PowerPoint about the differences between the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and Section 504. School leaders are responsible for providing accommodations and supports to students with disabilities. As the most highly litigated area of education, the two laws that exist to provide for the educational needs of students with disabilities can be confusing to school personnel and parents. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 2004, commonly known as IDEA, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 represent two legal efforts to improve the conditions of those with disabilities. This PowerPoint provides clarity to administrators, teachers, and parents on the differences between the two laws. The 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education decision was the first significant court ruling that impacted the education of children with disabilities. The court found that education must be made available to all on equal terms. After the Brown decision, parents of children with disabilities started bringing suit against the school and districts for segregating and excluding students with disabilities. Parents argued that the schools were discriminating against the children because of their conditions. In 1965, Congress enacted the Elementary and Education Act, or commonly known as ESEA. This act was passed to address the inequities of educational opportunities for underprivileged children. It was amended in 1966 to establish a grant program to assist states in the initiation, expansion, and improvement of the education of students with disabilities. In 1970, that program was replaced by the Education of All Handicapped Children Act, Public Law 91-230, which also established a grant program geared toward the development of educational programs for students and individuals with disabilities. In the early 70s, two U.S. District Court cases provided the foundation for states and local schools to properly educate children with disabilities by applying the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The first of those cases was the Pennsylvania Association for Retarded Children versus Pennsylvania. The case was over the issue of expulsion of children with mental retardation from public schools. The outcome was that educational placement decisions must include a process of parental participation and a way to resolve disagreements. The second case was the Mills versus the Board of Education. This case also dealt with suspension, expulsion, and exclusion of children with disabilities from the District of Columbia Public Schools. The school district primarily tried to use the defense that it was too costly to educate the students with disabilities in the public school setting. The ruling in this case was that the district failed to provide publicly supported education in their practice of expulsion, suspension, and exclusion of children with disabilities from the regular school without affording them the due process of law. By 1975, more than 30 states had passed legislation guaranteeing children with disabilities the right to a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. These state laws placed a new and heavy financial burden on states and local school districts. To assist with this burden, Congress passed Public Law 94-142, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. This law initially focused on access to education and due process of law. However, it also established a process by which state and local education agencies would be held accountable for providing services to all handicapped children. To this end, Congress included an elaborate system of legal checks and balances called procedural safeguards, which are designed to protect the rights of children with disabilities and their parents. Since 1975, special education law has been amended several times, with the most recent amendment occurring on December 3, 2004. With this action, Congress increased the emphasis on accountability for reading, early intervention, the use of research-based instruction, and education delivered by highly qualified teachers. So who qualifies for services under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act? To receive special education services, a child must be found eligible under a defined disability category, and they must be in need of service. The process begins when a child is identified for services and supports, and an individualized education plan is written. Once the IEP is agreed upon in a case conference, which includes participation of the parent, school staff coordinate placement and services. The plan must address the unique needs of the child and be delivered by highly qualified instructors. 
students must be provided with supplemental aids and services in order to be educated with non-disabled children to the maximum extent possible. Even though the IEP must be appropriate, it does not need to be optimal. This was addressed in the 1982 Board of Education v. Raleigh case where the Supreme Court rejected arguments of maximization of potential and found the idea guarantees access to specialized instruction and related services that are individually designed to provide educational benefit. Sometimes students with certain mental and physical disabilities are not eligible for services but still may need accommodations to fully succeed in school. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 is a federal law that prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. This law applies to both public and private recipients of federal financial assistance. Section 504 covers several areas including preschool, elementary and secondary schools, employment practices, accessibility, health, welfare, and social services. So how does a student qualify for having a 504? A student qualifies for needing a 504 when they are considered to have a disability. And according to 504, a person has a disability if they have a physical or mental impairment, they have a record of impairment, or are regarded as having an impairment, and this impairment substantially limits a major life activity. So once a student has a 504 plan, this plan will provide accommodations to minimize the impact of their disability on their education. Their services must be delivered in an accessible environment and the education must be designed to meet the needs of students with disabilities as well as it meets the needs of students without disabilities. So one of the biggest questions that I get as a school administrator for students with special needs is does a student need an IEP and a 504? The classic example of this is a child who has an IEP for a speech impairment and maybe also has some concerns for behavioral needs or other supports in which maybe a 504 is considered. I'm here to say that it's unnecessary to have an IEP and a 504. IEPs are designed to address all of a child's needs. A child with an IEP is automatically covered under the provisions of 504. So in answer to that question, only an IEP is needed. Now if a child does not qualify for services under IDEA in which they have an IEP, that child should be seen through the school process to see if they would qualify for having a 504 plan. I've included this nice chart that compares both the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and Section 504. In summary, parents and educators must understand that the law exists to provide for the educational needs of students with disabilities. Requirements for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act can be confusing to school personnel and parents. This PowerPoint outlined a legal and historical review of the two laws, providing clarity on the differences in overlap. I hope this information was helpful to you.